Hello, everyone. Today on the Doctor Who Guide, I am super excited to be joined once again by the incredible Will Hadcroft to talk about his latest BBC Audio Doctor Who audiobook, Dark Contract, read by the Matthew Waterhouse. Oh my gosh, who played Adric in Doctor Who. Welcome back to the show, Will. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Thank you for having me back. Oh, it's my pleasure. I absolutely loved listening to Dark Contract. This audio is, uh, once again, with uh, an incredible TARDIS team, uh, this time of the Fifth Doctor, Tegan, Nissa, Adric, peak season 19 TARDIS team. And actually, I'm going to screen share and we're going to take a look at the wonderful artwork by Lee Johnson. Mm. I mean, we've both talked on Facebook about how incredible uh, of an artist Lee Johnson is. Uh, he did all of the artwork for the Complete History uh, book series, um, one for each story. And so, I mean, incredibly, incredibly talented. We've got the Fifth Doctor, Adric, Nissa Teigen, the Man and Scythe Inn, and of course this incredible uh, background as well. I mean, there's stuff going on in the foreground, the background, the left, the right. It's like a very, very, uh, got a lot of depth into this which is uh yeah. really really cool and for those of you who don't know you can currently order dr Who dark contract it is a story read by matthew waterhouse and its description is when the tardis lands on earth in the 1830s tegan is keen to explore dickensian london the grim realities of poverty and destitution are sobering with conditions exacerbated by the new poor law Yet something else is affecting those most in need, something not of this world. As the doctor falls into the hands of the law and Tegan and Nyssa are abducted by a brutish pair of ne'er-do-wells, Adric finds himself on an altogether different plane at the heart of the malaise affecting the capital city. For the beings who have formed a deadly contract with the people of Earth, the presence of TARDIS travelers in London is inconvenient to say the least. Oh my goodness. So, Will... Welcome back to the show. I mean, we we talked almost exactly two years ago about yeah. Doctor Who, The Resurrection Plant, which Yay. I'm very, very excited about. Absolutely love this. So I knew that when I saw that there was a second uh, audiobook that you had written that I immediately had to get it. We talked about how you were very excited to have your uh, your first Doctor Who audiobook. Now you've yeah. got a second one out. How does that How does that feel? Are you excited to be back at it? Very much so, yeah, very much so. When the first one came out, because uh, it was my very first uh, official Doctor Who, there was a, a sort of feeling that I had at the time of, uh, well, if this turns to, out to be the one and only Doctor Who that I get to do, then uh, what, a, what a great one it was, you know, even though I say so myself. So then to, to be asked to do a second, because obviously I... I was hoping they would ask for another um so when they did uh yeah very exciting and uh thoroughly enjoyed the process once again uh, from the pitch to it finally coming out yeah very exciting right. indeed did you get to pick the doctor or was that part of the pitch that you got was this time around that they, they requested it from me so when i did the resurrection plant I had three different doctor and companion lineups, and they chose the one they wanted, the Patrick Troughton one. Uh, this time, I was asked by the producer, uh, Michael Stevens, who uh, told the editor, John Ainsworth, ask Will if he would do Fifth Doctor and Adric. What some ideas for those? So I said, does, does he mean just the Fifth Doctor and Adric? Um, or does he mean the season 19 ensemble? And John said, I think he means the latter. So I came up with three different ideas. Uh, four, actually, four ideas. Yeah, uh, they asked for three and I gave them four. <laughs> and um, and they chose the one that became Dark Contract. Um, and it was a joy to write. Amazing. I mean, Dark Contract, uh, you know, joins uh, uh, quite the uh, a lineup of season 19 uh, Doctor Who stories. Um, in name, it shares uh, the term contract with uh, 
other stories like uh, the Eternity contract um, and the Doomsday contract, the Dalek contract. Um, but it, interestingly, the Eternity contract um, is uh, written by Steve Lyons and also features the Fifth Doctor and Nyssa. So something about contracts being signed was going on for the, the Fifth Doctor uh, at this time. But um, when you talk about season 19 and working with that TARDIS team, you had uh, a piece in Doctor Who magazine, uh, issue 606, um, yeah. that's called Six Reasons to uh, Love Season 19, in which you highlight six moments that uh, meant a lot to you. And so as we talked about, you know, last time, how much it meant to you to write for the second Doctor and this TARDIS team, obviously you have some really good memories of growing up. You were 11 and three quarters when uh, when season 19 uh, aired. You have some good memories. And and I think that really came through listening to the story of, you know, to me, it really feels like it's it's from Adric's point of view and deals with, you know, that ongoing relationship that the fifth doctor and Adric had, which was butting heads at times. And, mm. you know, Adric got on really well with the fourth doctor. And so the regeneration, when you have a companion like that, tumbling over into a new doctor i can imagine that would be a very hard uh transition at times we saw that with clara and the 11th to the the 12th mm -hmm. doctors uh and i think it's a really interesting aspect so um you know talk to me about your you know growing up with adric because in in your door to magazine article you loved adric but that wasn't the case with your dad when you watched it with him <laughs> he, no he, indeed adric drove him nuts <laughs> Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of, um, well, not just my dad's generation, but but it, but even older fans, you know, fans who are just a little bit older than me. Um, so I was eleven and three quarters. I think I think fans who were sort of fifteen, sixteen, getting older, they disliked him because mm -hmm. he was seen as an obnoxious brat, uh, <laughs> uh, pompous, self-assured. Um, Less less so when he was with the fourth Doctor and Romana, but once once the regeneration occurred, this this is something uh, that I've reflected on a number of times over the years. Um, that there is a significant change in the relationship between the Doctor and Adric after the re regeneration. So he goes from the Doctor goes from a sort of mentor slash father figure to uh, more like an older brother. And the older brother is impatient with him. R rather than being parental and a mentor, um, the fifth doctor fi finds him irritating and childish. Uh, and and I think Adric sees the doctor as the, the overbearing older brother rather than the mentor. So the whole dynamic of it alters from Castro Valva onwards. Um, regarding, yeah, my dad... My dad used to sit sit in his corner watching the television uh, on a Saturday evening, you know, uh, when he was not working, and, uh, and and watch Doctor Who with me. So every time Adric came on screen, <laughs> he would go. After a few minutes of listening to him, he'd just go, "I hate that kid." He just <laughs> blurted out, uh, and and as I was, um, you know, a youngster, and couldn't really remember a time when there was a male companion in the TARDIS. Although although I was how old was I when Harry was in it? I would have been about five. Yeah. Yeah. Four going on five for that season. So I, I couldn't remember. I mean I couldn't remember the Brigadier either come to that. Uh, I, I learned about those characters through Doctor Who Weekly when that was published in 1979 and then became monthly and then magazine. So I grew to know about those characters, uh, but couldn't remember the Doctor travelling with a male character, uh, discounting K-9, if you want to consider him as male. Um, no no humanoid males. Um, so the idea of uh, you know me being uh, a young boy, and suddenly there's a young boy in the programme travelling with the Doctor. That was a big deal for me, because that gave me uh, a role model, I suppose. Yeah, and because he was like he was as well, very much an outsider, that chimed with my feeling, especially when I left uh, primary school uh, in 
it would have been sort of July 1981, and then started secondary school, the big school, as, you, as we might call it, uh, in September 1981. So I'd seen the regeneration in March. That was a big, a big deal in itself, because uh, the Tom had been the doctor right the way through my primary school life from four mm-hmm. to ten and three quarters. Uh, so to lose him was a massive deal. Then I make the transition to secondary school, and because uh, I'm I was very uh, um, shy, socially awkward, um, phobic even I'd say socially phobic uh, for a good few weeks uh, uh, when I started secondary school, very much a fish out of water. I did not gel or connect with it, hardly any of of my new school peers. It was. Yeah, it was a huge trauma, the transition to secondary school, and uh, didn't settle for quite a long time. So Adric was a boy who didn't belong anywhere. He, he didn't belong on the Starliner, on Alzarius. He didn't belong in his brother's gang. And so he stowed away on the TARDIS. And then after the regeneration, started to not belong with the Doctor and his companions either. So I was I was connecting with Adric at that time uh, as a character, uh, and he meant a great deal to me. Yeah. So all, older older fans and um, my dad's generation <laughs> didn't like him much, uh, but but I did I did, and and I have spoken to others of my generation who latched onto him the way I did. That's amazing, and you know you talk about relating to different uh, companions having that you know uh, representation of somebody who's your age on on screen as well uh the thing that often happens with younger uh doctor who companions is they they often end up being uh orphaned to deal with the the problem of the question of where are your parents you know why why are you okay with essentially being kidnapped in in the tardis i mean ever since you know vicky took over the role that was you know originally meant for susan they had to you know once again another orphan there and so in the attempt to simply explain that we're not kidnapping a, you know a, a young kid into the tardis it ends up yeah. resonating as a character who who doesn't have, um, you know, a family is feeling alone, is is you know feeling like they don't don't belong, um, and I think it's it's a really special thing where you know we we talk about you know nostalgia, um, and I think that certain times I, I really do believe that to some extent, uh, yes, certain doctors are are going to just always be more popular with the fan base. Um, you know, based on their own attributes. But I also think that to some extent, you could place us anywhere in Doctor Who's history and what we grew up with would, depending on the time of our life, make us relate more to a particular doctor. And so certain episodes have meaning to us simply because of what we were going through at that time um, and how Doctor Who helped us through it. I mean, that's kind of the amazing thing about this you know, 60 plus year old show is that, you know, it, anybody of us who's that age and younger, it's been around our entire lives uh, to some extent, obviously the wilderness years, but even then uh, in some way, shape or form. And so it must be so special to be contributing to that again with another uh, story that, that fleshes out this season for us, fleshes out these characters. Um, But was there, um, you know, a moment for you when you were writing this where it it felt emotional to you to to kind of be thinking about this time of your life and and writing Adric and feeling attached to to I mean, there's a particularly poignant scene which I will not uh, uh, spoil, but it's I have to imagine that 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 emotion came from you and and is coming through in the audio. Mm. If well, it depends which bit you mean, but I, I, I'll I'll talk about the without giving too much away. Um, the scene where he's thinking back, he's yes. thinking back. Is that what you're thinking That's of? The one. That's the one. Yes, thinking back over his relationship with the doctor, and um, 
and a sense of loss, really, for the fourth Doctor, um, and acknowledging to himself the change in the relationship, um, which, yeah, I mean, it, it, it reflects the character's feeling, but it also reflected, to some degree, my feeling at that time. The loss of Tom Baker, I can't, I can't put it into words really, because Peter Davison was so so um, dark a contrast. It was hard for me for quite a few stories of season nineteen to believe he was meant to be the same person that Tom Baker had played. It, I I even now feel that they dialed down the eccentricities too much. Uh, I, I understand John Nathan Turner's reasoning that the incom incoming Doctor is a stark contrast to the one that's just left. But I think it, the contrast is so stark that he comes across, for a, his initial stories at least, as just an ordinary man. Um, apart from the way he's dressed, that there, there are no um, eccentricities. There's no, there's no sense of otherworldliness. Which of course mm -hmm. Tom Baker had in spades. He he he, mm -hmm. he was otherworldly. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and there could be the argument that he is in real life, and that's why mm -hmm. it came across so well. Um, so to have this brooding, um, strange, uh, alien man with mm -hmm. certain human characteristics, but it, but in other words, very very. Um, unusual, reacted to things in a peculiar way at times, not the way we would react. Uh, someone that you you knew as soon as he walked in the room, he was going to take charge, he would solve the problem. And then he, he turns into this much younger looking man who doesn't appear to know what's going on always, doesn't seem to have the answers that quickly, uh, I mean, in, in the, at the end, he always tops the baddie. You know, he always gets there. But there's more of a struggle. Um, and as I say, he c comes across as an ordinary man who just happens to have a TARDIS. Uh, so when I was watching uh, those initial stories, I, I did struggle. I I found um, in Castrovalva, about halfway through, I was wishing he would change back into Tom Baker. And my young, my youngest brother burst into tears when he realised he wasn't going to change back. Uh, he, he didn't realise this was a permanent thing. Um, oh. And he did, he burst into tears. Uh, then when we get to Four to Doomsday, um, I found that hard going. Uh, I found the pace of it and, and the, the lack of uh, action uh, and dwelling a bit too much on the Aboriginal dancing and all of that, you know. Um, I found that hard going as well at the time. Tinder was another because it was very cerebral and dealing with sort of Buddhist themes, a very unusual story. So it wasn't until we hit the visitation, which was much more traditional in its style um, and more accessible as a result that I started to see the Doctor in Peter Davison's portrayal. Um, yeah. Now, I've re-evaluated the, the whole season many times over since, of course, uh, and in preparation for Dark Contract, I just I just acquired the Blu-ray of, of season 19. So I watched the entire season right through. And um, Castrovalva is better with its uh, upgraded effects. Um, mm -hmm. Not brilliant, but then I now understand it was hastily written. So that explains that it's, it's a bit weak. Um, not enough in it, really, to sustain four half hours. Um, but some interesting ideas. For To Doomsday, I like a great deal more now than I did uh, on the original transmission. I get the ideas and the concepts and they carry it for me. Um, and Kinder, I absolutely love. So at the time I struggled with that at 11 and three quarters. Now I absolutely love it because mm -hmm. I appreciate mm -hmm. the themes and the ideas as an adult right. Uh, right. that that went over my head at the time, really. Uh, yeah, so I, I have different a different feeling now about season 19 than I did back.
and uh, uh, stories that um, I was thinking about the Doctor Who magazine uh, season poll. I think they put Kinder last in the poll. I think I'm right. I've not seen it for a while, but I think it came last. And I, I there's no way I would put Kinder last uh, now. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's one of my favourite stories of the season. So my feelings, my feelings have changed a great deal of the one comes yeah. back back to it as an adult um, right. and see yeah. and sees a lot more going on than just yeah. what is depicted on screen. That's what I love about the Blu-ray box sets. I mean, we've got more now from the last time we did this did our, our interview than you know, now. Um, and the fact that they come out seemingly so so randomly um although there is a, a logic from the production side uh, i'm sure but the the fact that they come out so randomly and then as an entire season you know as collectors with the dvds we got to kind of pick and choose which stories we wanted to see what we wanted to buy but having it in a season-long box set means that you kind of do sit down and say okay i am going to watch through all of these again or okay mm -hmm. i'll give this one another chance because there's new audio there's new or better quality audio better quality images there's new cgi effects it, it mm -hmm. convinces you to sit down and, and give the whole season another go otherwise we'd probably all just skip straight to earth shock when we got <laughs> the season 19 yeah, box yeah, set yeah. right um yeah. so i do love that we get to you know free watch everything um in our marathons yeah yeah I, I, before uh but when we were collecting dvds i used to watch the kinder the visitation uh and earth shop the most right. do the scripts by heart and on occasion i would watch black orchid because it's a nice little two-part filler yeah. um yeah. And although some people are not keen on it because there's no science fiction elements in it, apart from the TARDIS, I kind of find that refreshing that we have this little moment where we stop for a moment. Uh, Eric Sayward once said it's between two heavyweights. You've got the visitation on one side and Earthshock on the other. And, and the idea was to have this little moment where we just stop and pause and breathe. Um, and that's what Black Orchid is. And I appreciate it for that. It's also, interestingly, a good one for introducing people who are not interested in science fiction to Doctor Who. My my wife likes Black Orchid, but for precisely that reason, it's not full of techno babble. It's easy to comprehend, a little bit like an Agatha Christie mystery, um, and and it draw it drew her in more than the Visitation did. But believe me, <laughs> um. So I kind of think, yeah, Black Hawk is good for that. It's good for trying, if yeah. you want to try it out, try Doctor Who out on someone who's not keen on sci-fi. I that love that. Do the trick. Mm. Because like, I, I was just thinking it, it's sort of like the, the new series equivalent might be uh the unicorn and the wasp um you know yeah, yeah. and that's uh, literally <laughs> agatha christie you know um that obviously has some uh alien <laughs> uh influences in that not a pure historical but the also uh, a story i love to introduce people with the doctor who is uh, vincent and the doctor uh because like you're yeah. saying when when there is too much techno babble or too much um too much time travel too much references sometimes it's really just about there's too much going on that i don't understand yet and that can yeah. pull people out of it and so i found that vincent the doctor is a great story for converting if you will uh yeah. people into doctor who who fans and i love having recommendations though for each for each and every uh doctor mm -hmm. um it's interesting how you going back to you describe um the transition between the fourth doctor to the fifth doctor and how emotional that was and I, I never thought too because you know even though nowadays and you know we we know to expect that you know there's going to be a regeneration at some point it's you know we know that this is permanent and even back then many people did but as a kid if you were watching this you really might not think that this is going to be a permanent change and so that's really when it sets in but you use the term the words stark contrast which i couldn't help but notice is very similar to dark contract um <laughs> stark contrast it's, it's only a couple letters different and uh that I, can be I the sequel that's... 
<laughs> that could be the sequel, Dark Contrast, Dark Contract. Um, and, you know, when they regenerate from one doctor to another, I hear what you're saying of, you know, they go in a different direction so that they can make their own mark so that it's not, you know, there wouldn't be a point to regenerating if it was just a new actor but playing the doctor exactly the same way as the previous one. Everybody wants to make their mark on it. But if you've really hit it right with the previous doctor, going in the exact opposite direction could be a mistake in some ways. I think Peter Capaldi's first season really kind of had that effect because um, it was too stark of a contrast. And, you know, as we get into series nine and series 10, he really hits his stride and he's an amazing doctor and people who I think give him that chance really love him and, and love his stories. But that stark contrast. If, you, can, if you'd have gone it. from, if you'd have gone from Christopher Eccleston into Peter Capaldi, it might not mm -hmm. have been such a a, um, a risk to exactly. be so different because Chris's doctor is quite cold in some ways and quite standoffish, mm -hmm. and it's only his um, friendship with Rose that makes him warmer and more human. Um, but because we had David Tennant and then Matt Smith, and both of them play play uh, the Doctor in a, a very accessible way. Uh, warm personalities that draw you to them to then go to this rather cold standoffish man um I, I mean i loved the line in deep breath where um after a while the doctor just says to clara i'm not your boyfriend clara because he's through the matt smith iteration you've got this kind of suggestion of a possible romance and then suddenly mm -hmm. it's all change and he says it to her face. I am not your boyfriend. And she, and she says, I, I know you're not. But she's flustered when she says it. Because clearly in her heart, that is what she's been thinking until the regeneration. Um, so I think, yeah, I think it, it can be a risk to change the doctor so radically uh, when the audience have had a number of years of a particular kind of doctor that they really yeah. love. And Tom... I mean, one of the things with Peter is that marks him very different to all his predecessors, the, the four predecessors, is that the Doctor up until then was always a middle-aged man. He was either late middle-aged, like William Hartnell and John Pertwee, or early middle-aged, like Patrick Troughton and Tom Baker. But to go to 29 years old, from 46 to 29, um, and then advise the actor to to just tone down all the all of it, dial it right down, the eccentricities and the otherworldliness, so that he's really not got a lot to play with. Uh, um, I mean, he said in interviews that when he took it on, he, he couldn't see in the writing any character uh, and had to go on his first day to John Nathan Turner and the director, was it John Black, I think, and say, how, right. how do you want me to do this? because there's nothing in the writing that suggests a personality. Uh, obviously, now, Tom Baker had the same problems, because in an interview, he's, he said, he used to shout at the director, this is just audible type, meaning that there is no character in it. Uh, so as an actor, he would have to put the characteristics in, which he was very good at. But Peter was approaching it the way, uh, the way he would approach anything else. Let's have a look at the script. Let's see what it suggests about the character's motivations, what drives him, what is his history. But you're presented with a character that we're, we're not meant to have any history as such. is a mystery. <laughs> so you can't have, apart from the, the bits we know, you can't have um, a background that informs the, the way the actor should play it, other than is a crusader, um, he, you know, he'll protect protect the underdog and challenge uh, corrupt uh, ruling regimes and all of that sort of thing. But as for a personality, there is nothing in the writing, so the the actor has to bring it. And I would say, maybe controversially, perhaps Peter struggled with that at first, because any other acting job, it's there on the page how to play it. So me. Me growing up, um, I was aware of William Hartnell and Patrick Troughton. My parents used to tell me about them. Um, I was a, a, 
aware of John Pertwee because I had residual vague memory of him doing it. But from age four up until 10 and three quarters, it was Tom Baker. So mm. to go from that to a very different style of portrayal uh, was was hard. But what we had, and this, this shows that it was being recognized at the time, in uh, November 1981, on BBC Two, uh, we had The Five Faces of Doctor Who, which yeah. was arranged by John Nathan Turner, because he was worried that my generation, who could only remember Tom Baker, might reject Peter Davis. So we, we had a, a treat uh, in the UK, because un unlike in America and other places where it, it's on constant repeat on the PBS channels, um, here, it wasn't. You had the season, uh, the current season, and then you, you had some of the stories from the current season repeated in the summer and then on to the next season. You never had previous Doctors repeated. So The Five Faces of Doctor Who was the first time I ever saw the, the first three Doctors on screen uh, that I could actually remember. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And then that, that helped the audience accept that there was going to be a new Doctor like you said that's that's so important and nowadays i think we just had um i think in ireland there's now a way to watch the latest season of doctor who i believe was the news um and we obviously have bbc iplayer uh in the uk if you're in you know if you're in a country that gets uh iplayer and the episodes are available to watch for free you know for me growing up it was you know, up until when BritBox started, maybe 2019, 2020, um, up until that point, you had to collect it all. And that that was a huge barrier. Yeah. So to now have free access in, in the UK to on BBC iPlayer to all of the episodes, all of the spinoffs and, and all of this new, you know, content and then, you know, it's streaming with the latest episodes. Um, but like it's it's so interesting and such a different way of approaching the show and and you have to remind yourself hey back then it was basically one and done you 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 didn't have repeats until you know really uk gold in the late 90s and stuff and you have maybe select uh you know reruns rather um but you really have one chance to to watch these episodes and so they definitely made a big impact and and john nathan turner was literally reminding everybody Hey, it wasn't just. I know it's been Tom for for years and years and years now, and it seemed like it would be forever. But the Doctor has been very different in the past, and will be uh, again. And it's moments like that that actually solidified the show's uh, continuation and, and survival. I mean, you know, mm. uh, I was just reading. That I've been going through the complete histories in order, and and you're so sad when when Susan leaves because she's the first of the original cast to do so and obviously it's a very you know even for episodes back then it was a very emotional uh departure and you're so sad that that had to happen and you know that uh you know William Hartnell is not acting when he's when he's you know torn up about her departing and and Ian and Barbara but it was those movements the regeneration from Peter Capal uh, Peter Davison to Tom Baker other way around that you know really highlighted the uh the made those moments that made the show survive looking at the very first you know transition of companions i mean we talked about mm. that orphan uh character archetype that you know really goes back to um you know even susan not having her parents but when susan left the show having to replace her with vicky um mm. originally going to be called tanny and then lucky as well were two version two the character names you can see uh, early scripts uh, with with that name uh, in there, so it could have been Tanny or Lucky, uh, but we ended up with Vicky. And and that moment when we go from Susan to uh, Vicky, or from you know Ian and Barbara on to uh, Vicky and Stephen, you know they were sad moments in the show. Even William Hartnell, Patrick Troughton, um, because you knew that if William Hartnell had had his way, he would have been the Doctor for the rest of time. And uh, so those moments of transition are the reason we still have the show or the reason it still survives. And so as much as we love uh, each character and getting attached to each character, 
the transitions, yes, they can be hard, but they, you have to remind yourself that, you know, for every companion that is your favorite, all of these ones had to come before and say goodbye. So in, in saying goodbye, mm. you're saying hello to the next, to the next thing. And, um, so speaking of transitions, character of Adric, uh, we, we talked about Earthshock and it being one that you go to all the time. Obviously your story has to be set before Earthshock because Spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it yet, spoiler alert, but that is Adric's last story. And uh, as is not quite so typical, I mean, Stephen Moffat wasn't even showrunner, uh, so he famously kills off companions. But, uh, you know, this is way before then, and, and Adric dies at the end of Earthshock. So yeah. talk to me. And doesn't, doesn't get resurrected. You know, Stephen Moffat's huh? famous for killing them and bringing them back over and over. Uh Maybe he's got access to the resurrection plant somewhere, and he's, he keeps bringing them back. But um, there we go. but um, in Andrew's case, he's dead and dead forever. Um, mm -hmm. My word, what what an ending! Yeah, what an ending! Never been done before. Never really been done since. Uh, I know Perry died, and then John Nathan Turner edited the ending so that she hadn't really because he was yeah. frightened of all the backlash he might get, as he did with Adric. Uh, mm. Yeah, yeah. I I have mixed feelings about about the departure of Adric. I, I know so, some people think it should never have been done. Um, and I, I know actors like Elizabeth Sladen talking about how Sarah Jane could, could be written out, um, or, or if she was ever to obviously pr prior to her passing away, if Sarah Jane Adventures was ever to end, should her character die in it? And she, she, she just said, no, I can't do that to the children watching it. Mm. Uh, so there is a sort of controversy about whether or not it should be done. My feeling is, certainly thinking about the Stephen Moffat stuff, um, that if you're going to kill them off, then they, sh they should die. Uh, and if you're going to kill them off and then resurrect them, just only do that once, really. Uh, mm -hmm. If it then becomes a sort of standard trope, right. at some point you're going to kill power. someone off and all the audience are going, oh, it's Stephen Moffat, he'll bring them back. <laughs> so so I think I think the, the Adric example, it, um, if you're going to do it, they must be dead, and that is what they did. And the fact that we're talking about it 40 years later um, yeah. sort of underscores that to me, really. Um, yeah. You know, the, the stakes, if they're going to be that high, they, it has to be real. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it shows as well that they chose that story to do for Tales of the TARDIS. And, you know, that's uh, sadly not something that's very... Um, accessible here in in the u.s but thankfully i was in the uk when it aired uh or first dropped on on bbc iplayer so what was it like for you watching that tales of the tardis uh episode with uh tegan and the fifth doctor and then you know we're calling adric yeah that, that was um quite a nice bit of nostalgia that um i'm not i'm not a fan who says this is canon now you know, the Tales for the TARDIS stuff is kind of... I, I just see it as an extra, th a nice extra thing, you know, uh, that you can have if you want it or dismiss if you don't. Uh, but for a piece of nostalgia, it was nice to see them again and nice to have, you know, and, and have mm -hmm. them talking about Adric. Um, I mean, what is canon is the power of the Doctor. So uh, the uh, Jodie's last one, where the Cybermen are attacking the unit and... Um, you get that lovely scene with Tegan and the Doctor takes the form of the Fifth Doctor for that conversation. And um, when I think the exchange is something like, all right, if you're really the Doctor, do you know what I'm thinking now? And he says, Adric. So there's um, a reference right back to it. Um, so it's clearly a big deal to Chris Chibnall because that's the thing he focuses on in that scene. Uh, so it stayed with us all. I mean, obviously, younger folks such as yourself have come to appreciate it later. But those of us who watched it on transmission, 
um, deeply affected me. Yeah. It really act, actually did my head in completely for about a week um, on transmission because we nobody had a clue this was coming. Uh, nowadays, we know a bit too much about what's coming. Um, so there are not many surprises. But jo John Nathan Turner was able to keep the stock of the Cybermen's return a secret. Um, that was astonishing that to get that reveal at the end of part one, destroy them at once. And uh, and realizing what they were, that final shot, the Cybermen are back. My word, you know, that was a big deal in 19, 1982. Um, I think over 10 million people were tuning in at that point. Um, so it was back to the sort of Tom Baker uh audience figures. Uh, and and Adric's death, yeah, and the, the silent credits of all of that again, blooming. That was uh, that was profoundly distressing for me at that age um, because a you don't expect a companion in Doctor Who to die, <laughs> and and b I'd latched onto him as a as someone I identified with, so that was a double blow. I, I remember bursting into tears shortly after the credits finished rolling. And uh, I cried pretty much on and off all night. Uh, I can remember going to bed and crying in bed. I got up the following morning for school, and it was the first thing I was thinking about when I got up. And uh, some school friends came around because we were going to walk to school together. And I burst into tears in front of them. And um, my mother was at her wit's end because she could see this was going to be this is going to be a problem. Because you can't go to school and burst into tears in class or something like that. You are going to be a laughing stock. Because um, I was a very sensitive uh, introvert boy to start with. So you don't want to put that on top of it, you know. It took me few days i'll be honest a few days to, to get right from it uh it was a big deal for me but when they repeated it uh some months later um i was thrilled that earth shop was going to be shown again because it's a cyberman um and I, I, I some friends had come around to watch it with me and they missed the, the original transmission of it so they knew adric was going to die at the end because i told them um and when it came to um it would have been the scene where um Adric says now I never know now I'll never know if I was right and you get the close up on his face uh, and holding his brother's brooch um for comfort and then we cut to the inside of the TARDIS and uh the, the commander Scott got to TARDIS got to TARDIS Adric's still on board. Um, I left the room at that point. Uh, I said, I'm sorry, I can't watch this. And I walked out the room for five or ten minutes, however long was left. And I could hear the dialogue from the kitchen, you know, so I knew what was happening. And I heard the explosion and I knew what came next. And then once I heard the continuity announcer come on uh, after the silent credits i knew it was over and done with so i went back in the living room to find my two friends rather sullen faced and a little tearful they were whole, they were fighting it back you know <laughs> they didn't want to cry in front of me um and, and and one of my well both of my brothers i think would have been there and uh i remember one of the lads saying um i can see why you walked out you know uh, he wasn't going to say it upset him that much, but he admitted, I can see why you walked out. It, it upset them. So I, I was, I remember that vividly, what, getting up and walking out. I just couldn't face that again. Couldn't go. I, I know that, as I say, old older kids, um, they watch that scene and they laugh when the freighter blows up. Uh, I once attended a Doctor Who convention where, where there was a string of clips 
set to a pop song. And it was it was done in a humorous way. It was deliberately funny. Uh, and I can't remember what the pop song was. But when it came to uh, Adric holding the brooch and then the freighter blowing up, it was timed with a particular line in this pop song. And the whole place was in hysterics because it was so funny. Um, and I remember sitting amongst them thinking, because uh, I, I could laugh at it then. You know, many years have passed by, but I thought, my word, uh, I wasn't laughing in 1982, that's for sure. So uh, it, it it did have a, a profound effect. It, it yeah. Death. So to fast forward 40 years and uh, write for that character and then have the actor who played him read it. Um, yeah. That, that um, I'm not going to say it's closure, you know, it's not that serious, but... Uh, I'm not the irony of it's not lost on me. Um, you know, if I, I just wish my mum was still around, that she uh, she would have been amazed to know yeah. that it's come. I I hasten to, I uh, I'm hesitant to say full circle, but uh, <laughs> it has come full circle to quote Dexeter in full circle. Um, that. Uh, all of that trauma back there in 1982. Um, and then here we are in 2024, and mm. I've written for the characters, the actor who played him is reading it. And um, yeah, it, it, it's astonishing. It's astonishing. Uh, it's not lost on me, you know, mm. the journey of that character, those stories, and me. Yeah. That's incredible. Um, you know, it's it's must be so special to think that, you know, this have the actor reading your own story and that that you're you you entered into a dialogue in a way with Matthew Waterhouse of this is this is who I see as Adric. This is what I am adding to his mythos, to his character. This is what I'm giving you. You know, we talked about the scripts that were, you know, just there's no character here. And that's what's really special is that, um, you know, we can, with the new series and stuff, we have just the way TV has changed. There's a lot more emotion written in for the characters. Whereas mm -hmm. we look back on some of these other episodes, and the actors of the day were just were say we're pushing for, we're trying to insert their own lines to to get mm -hmm. more um, emotion into into the characters. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, to to be able to enter into that dialogue with the actor and and you know, in there, you know, that affects how how he'll play Adric the next time. And it becomes a part of, you know, so much of, of this uh canon. I mean, that is that's just so special. And uh I I love that, you know, I mean that thank you for sharing that that story of of you know how it, it impacted you. I think back to my own experiences. I mean, I have absolutely cried when watching Doctor Who. I mean, when I, I first watched the chase and, and it, you know, it wasn't just characters that I had nostalgic for and growing up watching. It was going back and rewatching classic Doctor Who, you know, um, the rewatching the chase. I was absolutely crying at the end of that when Ian and Barbara left. Um, I remember a neighbor came over and needed to borrow the lawnmower. So they like knocked on the door and I'm like, you know, wiping my eyes and like trying to, you know, you know, like, I avoided any questions. So like, why are you crying? And when I, <laughs> I was just like, yeah, you can use the lawnmower. It's fine. I'm just watching Doctor Who. Um, but, you know, I mean, when Amy and Rory, um, they, the end of their, their story, um, I was absolutely sobbing after that. Um, and it's, it was also related to, you know, grief that I was going through and, and dealing with the mm -hmm. loss of my cousin, uh, you know, at that point going it, it it just all opened up a flood floodgates for me and i remember solid like half an hour after the episode had ended you know still in in tears of the thought of uh you know them going and i i wasn't even as attached to them as i was to to as it sounds that you were to adric but it still mm. it, it gave that opportunity for 
the emotions to be processed and that's good and and that's something that i think uh can can bond people together and i think you know for maybe 20 more years down the road i remember the the regeneration for david tennant again so sad yeah. solving but 20 years down yeah. the road there might be a funny edit of you know david tennant um regenerating and i'll have to sit there and and hopefully i'll be able to laugh about it and and yeah. not have it be as as impactful for me so i'm trying to you know relate to to what you're saying on that front i think that uh you know, it, it's, it's. I was very. I remember uh, as a seven year, a seven year old uh, being upset when Leela left. Um, mm -hmm. Now, obviously, uh, seven is different to going on twelve. So, Leela, yeah, Leela going at the end of Invasion of Time, just when she says, "I'm not coming with you," and he's sort of fighting against the emotions when he just shuts the door. Um, and then you cut to inside, and he just says, "I'll miss you too, Savage." Once, once he's got in there, and she can't see him. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, it's very corny now when she says, "Will he be all right, K9?" And the two two heads go down like that. It's a little bit corny, but to a seven year old, I was with him. I was there. I was with yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Will he be all right without me? You know. And then he pushes out that K9 Mark II in that big cardboard box. Um, and then you come to the next season and it's, right, Leela's gone, who's next? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But with Adric, you, you, I didn't have that with Adric. I was, I was older and um, and it's a death. It's not someone staying behind or getting married or they've got sick of travelling with him it's, and they want to stay where they are. It, it was a very different situation. And it's never been repeated. As I say, Perry is the nearest to it. I had a huge crush on Nicola Bryant. Um, I was getting approaching 14 when she debuted in uh, Planet of Fire. And I was 16 when uh, she was uh, wiped out by Lord Kiv and then yeah. taken over. Yeah, no, very dramatic ending. And then when it cuts back to the... the um, I can remember watching that unfold and thinking, oh, no, oh, no, they're going to transfer his mind into her and hoping the doctor would get there on the last minute. And then when he didn't, because um, I knew she was leaving, it was in the in the fan press that she was leaving, Colin Baker at the end of that, in the trial, um, the shock on his face, you know, and he just says, you've, you've killed Perry. It's just the way he says it. Even now, I can feel it now because <laughs> I'm re remembering it. Um, and then in the opening moments of the next episode where uh, he walks into the trial room extremely somber. So he's been given yeah. a period of time to get his head around what's happened. Very dramatic stuff, that. very. Uh, it's a shame that they undid it at the very end with the, mm. uh, she's now married to Yukarnos. Um, although I have to say at 16, I was relieved that she was still alive. Yeah. So my 16-year-old hat was going, oh, she's not dead, thank goodness. As a 54-year-old, I'm thinking, I think she should have been dead. Really. Because it, it undermined that dramatic exit for yeah. Nicola, uh, as well as the character. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, But that's the only other time it's it's ever been that, that heavy going emotionally. Um, right. Yeah, in the new in the in the post two thousand and five series, they've never dared go that far. Uh, and apart from even... Rory, and then he comes back in various forms. Um, but he always comes back. That's the thing. That's that's what makes it different in the modern era. And nowadays, we we know to expect that, you know, if we don't know years in advance, um, or or you know, a year in advance. We expect that a companion's going to leave end of a season, right? So we're always nervous in a finale. It comes along yeah, yeah, and we're yeah. like nail biting to like, are we going to lose them in the end of this finale? Um, but with Adric, I mean, that that was mid season, you know, like it wasn't. There was still, you know, another story to go, and it it was so unexpected, and and that's something and... that in classic. It's just come right. back to me, Alex, that very cruel they were 
to have Adric appear in Time Flight as an apparition and uh, leads you to think he wasn't dead after all and then he is dead after all. <laughs> that was very cruel. Very cruel to play that trick on me. Um, I took that very personally. <laughs> uh, and I think it may even have been in one of the trailers for the episode. Uh, they saw the Melka and they saw Adric and I can remember thinking, oh, oh, he's not, he's not, dead, he's not dead. Because I was, I was hoping at the start of Time Flight when Tegan is saying, "We're in a time machine, can't we just go back and get him?" I thought yeah. that might be the resolution the week after. So when it wasn't, that was awful. But and then you get this little cameo appearance of Matthew Waterhouse because his contract isn't hasn't expired yet, so they put him in it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that that was uh, like a double blow. That yeah, <laughs> dear me. <laughs> oh my goodness! And um, you know, we we talk about transitions and going from you know one companion to the next, from one doctor to the other. I want to shift from um, the fifth doctor for a moment um, to the sixth doctor, and uh, particularly a day where we both met him because uh, mm -hmm. since our last interview. I uh, have been able to go to the UK and we actually we met up while we were while I was in the UK and I absolutely had so much fun. It was amazing getting to meet you and in person Likewise. and sit and and have a have a coffee and be able to uh, to catch up and chat and also go to Barry Comic Con. I mean, this is it was Ooh. absolutely so much fun and um i i actually have um some pictures from the day of and uh so we've got here we are two of us look at us there <laughs> having a selfie uh yeah. saying hi to the camera and of course you know colin baker the the main attraction uh of barry comic-con getting to meet him yeah. there i got to meet him earlier in the day and then we met up and then I got to you know wait in line for you really towards the end of the day and uh, and took yeah. uh, your picture with your brother John as well yeah, there John, and yeah. what an amazing my day. abiding oh. memory of my abiding memory of that Alex <laughs> is when he said to you because um, he's not a Doctor Who fan he, he was quite starstruck meeting, meeting Colin Baker he never met anybody off television before. And he only came along. Um, he, he's got this bucket list of things he wants to do before he dies, uh, and one one was to, uh, to to meet someone off the telly. So when he knew that this very very comic con was coming up, he he said, "Can I come?" So uh, he met Colin Baker with us, and he was very very starstruck indeed. And he he, he never had much time for Colin's Doctor, you know, back in the eighties. Didn't like the way. He Played it, he thought he was far too pompous and self-opinionated and that very loud costume. None of it resonated with him back then. He has since revised his view. Uh, we watched Attack of the Cybermen a few weeks later uh, at his place and he, he's now decided that Colin Baker is actually very good. Uh, this is just because he met him. But the thing that I remember most fondly is when he said to you... Um, of course, you you haven't come all the way from Vermont to to Britain just for Doctor Who, have you? you you've got family here, and you're visiting various people along the way. And when you, when you said, "No, it is just for Doctor Who," <laughs> the look on his face, <laughs> he couldn't believe it. Uh, but but after we left the event, he, he he said he really enjoyed talking to you and meeting you. Yeah. He's oh. never encountered someone uh, apart from me who's so yeah. obsessed with it and so devoted that they would do something like that, get on several planes, leave Vermont and come to the UK just, just in inverted commas, for Doctor Who. Yeah. So every That's time amazing. I think of you, I always think of that conversation. It was. It was so much fun. And I remember that as well. And, you know, the thing was, it was like, just, yeah, absolutely. I was there entirely for Doctor Who. 
didn't don't have family <laughs> over there. Uh, you know, I, I hadn't met anybody in person ever before um, going over there. And so there absolutely were people like yourself who I knew who I, you know, video chatted with and stuff like that. But it, it was it was quite the, the leap of faith to uh, to, you know, say, I don't I, I didn't when I flew up, it, I didn't have everywhere I was staying lined up yet. I, you know, like that was a whole thing as well. And, and so it was, it was an, an amazing trip. And, and actually the, um, the vlog of that trip will fingers crossed, um, be coming out exactly a year to the day, um, this October 25th to November, uh, 19th. And so, uh, I've, I've edited the episode where we get to meet and, uh, I, it's so, such great memories and, uh, it's just so much fun. And, you know, meeting Colin Baker there, I mean, it's absolutely true that if you've met a doctor that that can't help, but like, you know, I relate to your brothers, you know, they, it can't help, but make you, if you've had a good experience meeting them, make you appreciate their doctor more um and you know i absolutely do think that my one of the reasons the seven doctor is one of my favorites is because i i've got to meet him in in 2016 and then when i went back in in 2023 and so you know getting to meet colin baker i met him at the beginning of the convention and he was in such great spirits i mean you expect that i made sure we got there early we're at the beginning of this line there was something like 1300 1400 people that walked through, I was talking with uh, some of the people who worked at the museum that, the art museum that it took place at. Uh, and they they said it's some 1300 people came through that that door. And I think every single one of them went and, and met uh, Colin Baker that day. And, and so we were all coming back, you were at the end of it, and he was still in such good spirits. I think he had something like a half hour break but like the whole day in such good spirits and so it was it was really special to to be able to meet him and of course kind of meet him uh, you know another time when i took your picture and and uh so you know i i didn't expect him to remember me you know 1300 people later um but i did uh when i went to i saw him again uh at uh, london film and comic-con um just a couple weekends later and so it was really amazing it was so amazing to meet up with you i mean in the corner of that picture you can actually see the the copy of the resurrection plant that you brought for him uh which i thought was so cool so cool yeah. to be like hey i've written a, an audiobook here they you, know, you can you can have it and so that was that was very very cool to see you I've, I've known i've known him on and off for a, a few years superficially of course i mean i don't have his phone number or anything like that um, but um, I wanted him to see that I'd, I'd done it because he, he, he knew I was a writer and he knew I'd had some uh, modest successes uh, and he knew I was, I'd was i been commissioned to do this Doctor Who, the, the, the first one, Resurrection Plant. So I wanted him to, to see I'd done it. So I thought, I'll bring one and I'm going to sign something for him for a change. Uh, mm -hmm. he, seemed quite, he seemed quite taken with it, didn't he? So, uh, yes. yeah. I hope he's played it and I hope he enjoyed it. Yeah. I bet. I'd I love bet. it to do one, of course. You know, I have an idea really? for a six doctor one, but uh, I've got right. to get it past my editor and producer <laughs> first. I right. told Colin the idea and he said, Tell John I'll do it. And I, I thought, Amazing. well, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what Colin is like. Um, so if I can. There's a particular aspect to it I had to sort out, uh, which uh, I ran the basics by John Ainsworth, and he said um, there's a particular aspect that needed some attention before we could present it to the producer, Michael Stevens, who mm. even then might say no. Uh, right. There are no guarantees. You know, he, he might mm. come to me, if, if there is going to be a third one, he might come to me and say, right, I want this doctor and this, this companion mm. and give us something for them. So me drafting something up in advance might go nowhere, but uh, I do have a, a Colin Baker one in the works if if they want to have a look at it. You best believe I'm I'm trying to guess in my head. Okay, so he's done a second Doctor one, and now he's done a fifth Doctor one. What's the next one going to be? Which Doctor? Yeah. Which TARDIS crew? You it know, it can be any of them up and to, up to and including Jodie Whittaker. They 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 never cover the. The current one on television so right all right. the past doctors are, are up for grabs 
and it depends what they've got already scheduled with other writers over exactly. the next year or two. Yeah, yeah. So it could be yeah. any of them. Mm. The future is bright, and I cannot wait uh, to be having this interview again, having listened to your third story as well. Um, and uh, so I, I for one, uh, will absolutely be getting this one. And to uh, to any uh, producers uh, listening, uh, I will absolutely be buying every single audio that will have Croft <laughs> rights. Because, oh. So let that be known. Um, <laughs> Thank you so, very much, Alex. I am thrilled to have you here. Of course, Dark Contract is linked in the description down below. Uh, I absolutely highly recommend it. Um, five out of five stars because of the fifth doctor. Of course, five stars for the fifth doctor. Of course. Five stars of mathematical excellence <laughs> out of five. I like it. I like your style. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me today, Will Hadcroft. It's been an absolute pleasure, as always. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Give my regards to Ethan when you next uh, chat with him. Will do. Um, interesting to see what Ethan makes of it, too. I'm sure he's going to love it. Oh, my gosh.